Welcome to Pulp Morum, the search for a lost literary classic from the Pulp Era. I feel terrible, you guys. I recently dabbled in the clickbaity takedown side of YouTube recently, and I I may have drawn fellow booktuber Ollie into the fire, and, you know, I thought I was pretty fair, but it's possible he caught a few strays. I don't know. I feel bad because Ollie has recently released a video that I haven't doctored or altered or taken out of context in any way, but I mean, it, it really it really put things in perspective for me. I mean, take a look. Because I've got a limited capacity. To Ollie, I had no idea. I, uh, I apologize. I truly do. Like, the internet needs to be a kinder place, and it's time that I start doing my part. I'm, I'm really sorry. You, you hide it well. Maybe it's the accent. I don't know. But first, let's talk about the author. Russell Robert Winterbotham was an American writer born August 1st, 1904, and he died in 1971 at the age of 67. I can't find a picture of RRW, so just use your imagination. That's what you came up with? Winterbotham, not Mrs. Featherbottom. Um... I'm surrounded by children and idiots. Winterbotham was a newspaper man and editor for Scripps Howard and wrote many big little books and comics. He often used the pseudonyms Franklin Hadley and J. Harvey Bond. His first foray in science fiction came in Astounding Stories in 1935, and he went on to contribute 60 or so short stories to the pulps. He's written seven sci-fi novels, along with a handful of crime, western, and a few non-fiction. Which brings us to the Red Planet. When the spaceship Jihad blasted off from Mars, millions of miles from Earth, four men and one woman placed themselves under the rule of Dr. Lewis Spartan, sadistic, power-mad leader of the expedition. Only after they were well on their way did they learn that Spartan planned to return to Earth alone. By the time the ship reached Mars, jealous rivalry over the love of Gail Loring had turned the Jihad into a crucible of tension and strife, but their internal struggles were nothing compared to the threat of the grotesque Martians who used electrical energy as a weapon of war. Suddenly, the Earthmen had to unite to stave off a massed Martian attack, a fight which, if lost, meant isolation and death on Mars, and, if won, meant buckling Spartans' demonic schemes. Red Planet is an original story published by Monarch Books in 1962. I have the first edition. It is 140 pages and originally cost 35 cents. The cover is by Ralph Brillhart. I like Ralph. He's one of my favorite cover artists in this era, and this book is no exception. If you close your eyes and try to imagine mid-century sci-fi, this is the image that pops in your head. I first saw this book when Nick over at the book graveyard did a book haul and commented, the Red Planet cover is freaking awesome. We ended up doing a book trade, and lo and behold, this shiny, beautiful diamond in the rough. And boy, was there some rough. What I'm trying to say is if this review video ends up sucking really badly, it's Nick's fault. That's just more interesting to me. The Red Planet typically goes for about five or six dollars online. And let's talk about what I liked. I like the concept. I think it's pretty fun. The back cover was a little clunky. Uh, however, the, the story, the plot, I, it's really enjoyable. It's unique and it's interesting, and I like it. It's a small team of astronauts on this maiden voyage to Mars, uh, but the stern commander, as soon as they leave Earth's gravity, turns tyrannical. Um, the ship uh, ends up falling victim to sabotage. There is murders, there's tension, and the tension gets gets ramped up continually. Back onto that, once they get to Mars, they're under the threat of this alien attack. Things just go from bad to worse. As I say, the concept, it was fun, and I was engaged from start to finish. Winterbotham's writing. He made an effort to be as scientifically grounded and accurate as possible, which, which you never would have guessed that from the front cover. It didn't always work, but I appreciate the attempt to make the world building realistic. Winterbotham took this story seriously, which, let's be honest, in this era, may not be the most common thing. The titular Red Planet. Mars is alien and interesting. Everything is toxic from the flora to the fauna. The aliens are also quite unique, and they don't really look like this on the cover, um, which is kind of a bummer. <laughs> but, uh... Even though they don't look quite like this, they were still very alien, and Winterbotham actually took the time to add some depth to the aliens as well. Despite good intentions, First Contact is rife with unintentional conflict and misunderstanding, followed by a rash incident. 
There's no way to communicate, to clear up the misunderstanding. War is at hand, and the humans are vastly outnumbered. It took us almost two-thirds of the book to finally get to Mars, and I would have liked to spend more time there to have more of the story take place there, but, I mean, no real complaints here. As soon as the action starts, it feels like Winterbotham gets excited. Um, I was surprised to learn that he didn't write much, if any, men's adventure because I really got the sense that he would have excelled in that genre. Still, I like it when you can tell that the author is having fun. And old Russ was having a blast blasting alien dogs. And now, the bad. I just feel that women are generally less competent than men and less rational. Again, I'm not a sexist. Okay, here we go. I'm not a feminist. I'm, but neither am I chauvinist or sexist. I'd say I'm fairly egalitarian in regard to the sexes and hold the belief that truth and most people are probably somewhere in the middle of most spectrums. To quote the ancient book of wisdom, Ecclesiastes, it is good to grasp one and not let go of the other. The man who fears God will avoid all extremes. Amen? Amen. Anyway, Russell Winterbotham is not in the middle. Russell Winterbotham was born in 1904, so naturally he was going to be more chaste than, I would say, modern authors. So a lot of the stuff in here can be explained away because of the era. Maybe not all of it. Apparently the space program that everyone here is a part of is so hyper-puritanical that the thought of five single men and one single woman alone in space for two years is too much scandal for the world to handle. Yes, Lord. To avoid this scandal, they arrange a fake marriage, and Gail Loring ends up choosing the main protagonist, Bill Drake. Okay, you'll be my fake husband. This fake arrangement uh, made everyone else on the ship turn insanely jealous. Hey, I wanted to be her phony husband. Jealousy turns to rage, then to attempted rape, then to murder. Murder? What was that you said? Two thirds of this book is every male character fighting over a woman. I'm triggered. To Winterbotham's credit, at least Gail is a real character. She has her own personality. She's competent. She's just, she's just trying to do her job here, guys. At least until the very end when she throws herself into the arms of the protagonist and declares to hell with the agreement. In those bygone days, I thought a trip to Mars was a career. I'm a woman, Bill Drake. That's my real career. I just feel that women are gen- Winterbotham is a competent writer. Now, he's not blowing your hair back with wild prose, and he's not winning any awards, but I would say he's a competent journeyman, and there's nothing wrong with that. However, it's a long ways to Mars, and our characters did some philosophizing and some pontificating at certain points, and it was beyond clunky. These soapbox scenes weren't set up, and Winterbotham really needed to trim and edit these portions because uh, he ended up, these characters ended up repeating themselves on several occasions. I had a, a friend a long time ago who didn't like dead air, right? Didn't like silence. So he always felt the need to fill that silence with words. That, and there was kind of an infer inferiority complex, so he really felt the need to have long sentences so he sounded smart. As a result, he ended up, he would repeat himself. He would, you know, he'd say something and then say the exact same thing backwards. It was kind of frustrating because he literally said everything twice. That's what happens quite a lot. I think Winterbotham did this to make these characters, maybe he was trying to convince us that they were intelligent. Um, it didn't. Obviously, there's a lot of drama in this book, but it's stupid. It's Let me be fair, it's kind of stupid. It's not outright stupid. Uh, because the sexual tension of five men and one woman in a spaceship, these cramped quarters for two years, I mean, that's interesting. There really could have been something there. But that's not the focal point. The focal point is the fake marriage. That's what everyone has taken issue with. I don't understand why she chose you. What do you got going for you that I don't got? So almost instantly, men start fighting and trying to kill each other. Yeah, she should have, she should, she should have chosen me. She should have chosen me. Ah! She should have chosen me. 
for nothing. It's not like the phony husband was getting it. It's a long way to Mars, so let's try and have some fun. <laughs> Dr. Spartan, the man in charge of the mission, is evil. We're talking 100% villain, but he, he's, he's not just a bad guy. <laughs> he's a comically bad guy. I am the ruler of your souls, and I hold the power over life and death. That's what he said after discovering one of his crewmen had smuggled aboard a deck of cards. Normally, this would be in the bad section, but he was so ridiculously, incredulously evil that I found myself grinning every time he was on the page. I am untethered and my rage knows no bounds! Dr. Spartan murders a man and tries to murder the protagonist, Bill Drake. Bill knows it. We know it. Dr. Spartan knows that Bill knows it. Gail knows it. Literally everybody. Everybody. Everybody on this ship knows what just happened. So what do we do? Well, he is in charge, so we better do what he says. But we'll keep a watchful eye on him. <laughs> I would not be surprised if Dr. Smith from Lost in Space was modeled after Dr. Spartan. Why? Just shoot him. Why are you letting your kid hang out with... He's a, he's a straight-up villain who tries to kill people constantly. He's just allowed to tag along. Oh, Dr. Spartan, don't you try and kill us again. Who, me? I am offended at your accusations. At one point, he sabotages the water supply, meaning there's only enough water left for two people for the return voyage. I suspect he means to kill some of us. You think? We better keep our eyes peeled for anything fishy. It's so simple. Toss him out of that airlock. No, we don't want to be court-martialed when we get back home. Listen, if you don't take care of him, you're not getting back home. The best part is when they are under attack from the Martians and someone says, quick, give Dr. Spartan a gun. I'll give you one guess as to what happens. You irk me. So what's the verdict? Ebook, uh, three out of five. The cover's a treat, and the story is solid. If you can look past some fat plot holes and outdated chauvinism, then I think you'll have a good time. Winterbotham is earnest, and while I wouldn't go out of your way to track this one down, if you happen upon it in the wild for a couple bucks, I think you could do a lot worse. And that's my review of The Red Planet. Have you guys read this? Or maybe a better question is, what's your favorite book that takes place on our little red neighbor up there? Let us know in the comments. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time with Bum Side. Ah, gotcha. You wish, right? Flight to Terror. Food like a banger in the mouth. Oh, right, I forgot. Here in the States, you call it a sausage in the mouth. We just call it a sausage.